Good morning and welcome to the Next Gen Planners Big Breakfast. I'm Joe Scott and Camacho. And I'm Chanel Pattinson and we are here to bring you a fresh perspective on careers in personal finance and financial planning. That's right. And throughout the show, we want to hear from you. In particular, our Big Breakfast Big Topic returning to the office. So get sharing. Okay, so coming up on today's show, we have four awesome guests. We've got Vaveen Cameron from the Chartered in Insurance Institute, Ollie Smith from New Model Advisor, Sonia Raj from Money Marketing, and Hannah Wimes from Next Wealth. So let's get straight into the show with our first guest, Vaveen Cameron from the Chartered Insurance Institute. Morning, Vaveen. So tell us a bit more about your career path and what led you to financial services. Well, um, I've always been uh, very passionate about helping people, um, particularly helping them uh, learn their roles, learn their jobs. So my first role was entry level in legal. Um, and that's where I learned I've actually got, a, I had a skill or a knack for helping people learn their job. I was always the person that was asked, could you just show this person how the system works? And then gradually, I went to university a bit later, got a degree and uh, started to look at well, what else do I like to do? So moved into higher education and worked um, uh, for the University of London and was asked there to train some of the lecturers and the students in terms of how we manage our functions and how that all works. And I found I had a skill or a knack for that. So gradually I just thought, right, what do I like doing or like training? Um, and an opportunity came up at American Express in the financial services, global, global market services. And they were phenomenal. I had great male um, and female role models, co coaches, mentors, and I became a, a professional trainer. Um, I qualified. I decided after leaving American Express that I would contract to see if I could transfer my skills. So I, I did a contract to M&S, Google, went to a startup just to see, you know, could I change, you know, move those skills and help people, help them in their roles, help them get to where they needed to get to. And really found that I really enjoyed the skills element of helping people develop and eventually got a role at the Chartered Insurance Institute. And principally, I'm able to do what I love, which enable people to progress in their careers, all kinds of talent, all different types of people in this fantastic option of financial planning and financial services. Wow, you've got a wealth of experience there with some great organisations. That's amazing. And I understand that you are the Education and Partnership Manager at CII. Can you tell us a little bit about what that job involves? Yeah, so I, I use my knowledge and experience um, to help a lot of people uh, obtain their first role or even if they're tenured, help them transition and upskill in this ever-changing world of financial planning and financial services. And this is a point where I say that um, new talent's not just 18 to, or 19 to 24, it's 19 to pensionable age of choice because, you know, we're in a, a world now where things are changing so rapidly and people are having to upskill or reskill. Um, principally at the Chartered Insurance Institute and part of the group is the Personal Finance Society that looks after our financial planning and finance professionals. We facilitate people coming in to the profession, mainly for universities, and I spend a lot of my time uh, working with universities, working with soon-to-be graduates or people that have gone back to study and connecting them with employers so that they get a fulfilling and uh, fantastic career. Um, and it's, it's great. I, I, I really love it. I really enjoy it. And I, I think it's a fantastic profession for people to go in, both the financial planning side and the insurance side of which the Chartered Insurance Institute is the professional body for. Amazing. I think it's so needed as well. It, like you said, I completely agree. It's such an amazing job, but I don't feel like it's out there loads. So I think trying to get more more graduates and things like that into it is amazing. So what challenges do you think university graduates face when looking to break into the financial planning profession? Yeah, I mean, it's a number of things. We're in, we're in challenging times. You know, I mean, I've worked very hard with our university partners to understand what are they facing? What are their final year students facing? How can we as a professional body, how can we help? And I, I think the three, thing, three main things that have come or become apparent is, is knowledge. The fact that a lot of um, final year students, a, a lot of people don't know about this fantastic gem of profession that, you know, you can have a very long and fulfilling career that, you know, whether you are wanting to help people and service people, 
whether you're interested in investments and making money. There's so much scope and shape and form as to what you can do. So that's the first thing is raising the profile and knowledge that this, this fantastic profession and, and op- occupation and roles exist. Secondly, I'd say is application. Um, helping uh, graduates and new talent to understand how to secure that first opportunity uh, or how to transition into the next opportunity into financial planning. So it's apply, how to apply, how to get into the profession. And thirdly, personality. So I spend a lot of time, I literally on a, a webinar yesterday with, with uh, final year students saying with employers, look, your qualifications, your degree will get you a seat at the table. And even if you don't have a degree, there are people in the profession that don't have a degree, but have qualifications. That's going to get you the seat at the table. What's important is how do you come across? What's your personality? Do you communicate? Can you listen? You know, we're asking people in this profession to trust us with large sums of money, their personal wealth. And if you can't convey to them that you're trustworthy, that you've listened to their needs, that you thought about and considered what they're trying to achieve for their life goals, then that's not about academics or qualifications. That's about being a person, being human. Mm. So those are three things, knowledge, application and personality. Yeah, absolutely love those three. Very, very useful as well. And for, for undergrads, is there anything that can sort of prepare them for applying for financial financial positions? Yeah, so Joe, there's a number of things that they can do. Um, I think the first thing is, is, to, is recognition. You need to be known. So what you can do is become a member of the CLI, PFS, um, and that will raise your profile with people that work in the profession. A lot of our members are uh, hiring managers, particularly if they're SMEs, small, medium enterprises. Uh, we're a globally recognized professional body. So globally, employers recognize us in the field. Obviously, if you go to certain countries, you're going to have to nuance what you know. But fundamentally, those professional qualifications get you traction, get you take you places. Um, Being a member also gives you access to uh, professional qualifications um, and continuing professional development. So once you're qualified, you still need to make sure that you're current, that you understand the regulations and changes, but you also need to develop. So I'd actively encourage when I put my L&D hat or trainer hat on to make sure that you keep your skills up, both your technical skills, but your soft skills. So we've all had to learn how to do this communicate and build relationships on online platforms and not in person. So that's an example of, of, of you know, continuing professional development. And, and a word of caution on recognition. If you're going to put that you're a member of the CIO PFS, you know, employers will call you out in an interview and say, well, what do you understand by that? Where are you a member? What have you done? So recognition, I think, is, a, is, a, is a, one of the key things. Network, it's a network, network, network. You can do that through um, becoming a member, through the regional committees, the small, medium enterprise employers, the hiring managers. Get them to know you. Get a mentor. We've got a fantastic e-connect mentoring scheme through the CIPFS that you can join. So, you know, you can get someone to help you understand how to get that first role, how to be recognised. And we've got lots of network groups as well. So you can join those, practice your voice, practice who you are, how you're known. And thirdly, more importantly, you need to take action. You need to apply for roles. So you can go to www.ciicareers.co.uk, post your CV up there, have a look at the roles and opportunities. Think laterally, you know, um, sometimes finding a job is just something as simple as asking for work experience or volunteering or asking, can I shadow so I get a handle of what this is all about? You know, take action and apply for roles and always ask for feedback. So if you're not successful on the first one or two roles you apply for, ask the hiring manager or employers, you know, tell me what meant I didn't get this role on this occasion or what could I do differently? So the three things, get yourself recognized, network, 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 and take action. Go out and be brave and and secure that role. Brilliant. I think that's amazing advice for anyone sort of thinking about it. So switching topic here for a moment, Mm. CII have been heavily involved in the Ensuring Women's Futures Initiative and research. So what do you think, or sorry, why do you think this is important? And what have you found to be the most interesting points to come out of this research? Yeah, I mean, it's a really great report. It's a really great initiative. Um, 
the first thing I really want to stress is how important it is for everybody individually to own their own financial capability and security. Um, it, it is so, so important, as we've seen in recent times, you know, people being furloughed, moving jobs, you know, making sure that you are secure and that you can manage life is really, really important. Um, the other main thing that really struck me from the recent report is, you know, how the pandemic has in, uh, impacted vulnerable groups, um, particularly women fall into those groups. Um, usually or historically, should I say, they've traditionally been the um, ones to undertake lower skilled jobs. They don't necessarily get paid the same as their counterparts, who are male. Um, and they tend to be the carers. And when I say carers, that takes all shapes or forms of caring, whether it's elderly family, disabled children or their children generally. Um, it, it often forms to women, which means that they have to rethink about their working life, um, maybe ask for lesser hours, ask to be more flexible, which can impact their earning power and therefore brings them to a degree of vulnerability. So. My, my overriding thing that's come away from that report is how important it is we need to take action to redress that balance. So owning our own financial capability, um, being an ally, so the uh, PFS, Personal Finance um, Society, its regional committees, are, we've got champions that work with us to do financial capabilities in schools, to educate younger people, in terms of managing their money, understanding how to manage their finances to protect for their future and getting that done early doors is really important. Um, and also allyship with other networks to help vulnerable groups, help people understand how to make sure they can ensure their future and, and just make sure their future is secure. So really great piece of work. I, I you know, really encourage you all to have a read if you've not read it already and, and think about how you can educate inform not only yourself but your children and your friends and your family that's absolutely brilliant i love that you're working with vulnerable people and helping them get into the industry as well it's brilliant um now one more thing before we go i know that next gen planners and cii are working together to take the university boot camp to 10 different universities can you tell us a little bit more about that and how employers can get involved so i'm really excited about this this is um really great this is something as a professional body we're really keen to work with the profession to grow talent into the profession and we're doing that as you say of, um, next generation planners it's a fantastic opportunity for our graduates particularly those studying finance accountancy economics but that's not excluding we're very open so you know i've met marine biologists economists who come to financial planning and find that it's for them um so that's the first thing we're doing. That's a great opportunity to your earlier question about how can people get their first role or opportunities. It's a great opportunity for final year graduates to get in front of uh, employers, practice their skills of interviewing technique, presentation, all the things that are going to help them secure that first role in a, in a non-threatening and safe environment that's really going to help them and coach them. It's great for our hiring managers and employers who may not have the means necessarily or the resource to go on a huge recruitment drive, but they get a sense of what kind of talent's out there. And they maybe even bag themselves some new talent, who knows? But really excited to see that happen. Um, so our employers, if, they, if you are an employer, you're listening to this and you wanna get involved, we're not precluding people because you're not, you're not in a, I don't know, Manchester, or you're not in Middlesex or you're not in Leeds. You can very well, you're very welcome to work with us and help us in these different um, universities we're going to. So if you uh, email contact at nextgenplanners.co.uk and the team will pick up there and assist you in being allocated. Um, but this is a point where I thank our employers and I thank our students for uh, just getting engaged in this and working with us to grow new talent into profession. And I really want to champion, it's not just 19 to 24, it's you know everybody that's making a career change that's uh, at universe, our universities and wanting to know, is there scope for me? Absolutely there's scope for you. Um, we're really keen to see people with, uh, who are transitioning because you have fantastic skills already in terms of soft skills, um, in terms of interpersonal skills, being able to talk to clients, particularly mature clients who might want to sit in front of someone that's got a little bit more life experience. 
but equally, you know, we want to balance. We're, we're an open and equitable access um, profession and we want all sorts of people, lots of diverse talent to get involved and, and become, come on board with us. Amazing. Thank you, Vivian. I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, so we sadly have run out of time, but please stick around and join us for our big breakfast topic discussion later. Sure, will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next up, we have Ollie Smith from New Model Advisor, who is here to talk about what financial planners can do to engage more with the press. Over to you, Ollie. Press. I've got 10 minutes to do this, which is pretty much one tip per minute. Um, so here goes. Bear with me. Uh, tip number one is know the rules of engagement. There are three rules of engagement, roughly, that you need to know about when speaking to a journalist, and they are as follows. Number one, on the record. Number two, off the record. And number three, Chatham House rules. Now, the first two should be fairly self-explanatory, but you need to be clear with your reporter or editor about the nature of your comments and how you want the conversation to be registered, if at all. Be careful. If you want to be an anonymous source, you're still technically on the record, though your identity will be protected. If your conversation is fully off the record, say so, and the reporter should honour that. A reporter should be a person of their word. Um, another phrase you might encounter is background information, which is sometimes used euphemistically to describe an off the record conversation. But if you're unsure about what type of conversation you're having, make sure you ask and make sure you assert what you want. Um, and Chatham House rules finally, well, when we're able to meet again, we might find ourselves in a room with important people. And Chatham House rules means that anyone can report what is said in the room, but without naming who said it. So that's an interesting sort of distinction, a middle ground perhaps between the two. Um, tip two, know thyself. This is really, really key. Before you begin any media engagement, have a little think about why it is that you want to speak to the press in the first place. Are you building your personal profile in the no local newspapers to drum up business? Are you taking on the big guns fearlessly by calling out bad provider behavior? Perhaps you're running an event. In the worst case scenario, perhaps you feel forced to comment on a negative story that has appeared about your firm. But be clear with yourself about what your strategy is and stick to it. And remember, politely declining to comment is always an option. It's better to keep your mouth closed and look like an idiot than to open it and confirm to the whole world that you are one. Uh, tip number three, back to school and back to basics. Can you read and write? Of course you can. Everyone can learn to read and write at school. It happens. We can all do it. Fair enough. Um, but a lot of people are pretty bad at it. And it creates a bad impression in your marketing and in your media work if you stroll blindly into a situation that actually exposes that as a weak point. So get your articles and comments checked for basic errors. There should be no spelling mistakes. Your apostrophe should be in the right place and everything should be neat and tidy. And when you're done, just check it again for howlers. There's a very old and probably apocryphal story of a book about canal journeys being unpublishable because the sea was missing from canal. I'll leave that there. Perhaps you can work out why that was a disaster. Um, tip four, don't try and control the process. As a financial journalist, I promise I will never ring you up and tell you how to do your job. You're the expert at advising clients, finding out what makes people tick financially, and I dare say you're a dab hand at analysing complicated options. I'll leave all of that to you. Leave the article construction, the syntax, and the headline to me. Of course, if we spell your name wrong, which does occasionally happen, feel free to send me a passive-aggressive email, and I'll beg for forgiveness by sending you beer. Uh, journalists will respond to issues surrounding factual errors in that way, but leave the aesthetic choices and the editorial decisions to us. Tip five, don't mug us off. Don't mug anyone off. Um, it's exciting to talk to journalists for the first time, and you'll probably get a kick out of seeing the impact that your comments can have on a debate or issue. But remember to stick to your promises. If you've given a journalist an exclusive story with your comments attached to it, that's great. But don't dishonor that arrangement the moment the next journalist comes knocking from another publication, perhaps. Journalists should be people of their words, as I've said, but so should you. Tip six, the seven Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. Now, working in financial services is a busy affair, so there's no need to memorize war and peace before you speak to your reporter or editor. We know you're hard pressed for time, but maybe do a little bit of preparation so you can really put some meat on the bone. Including a few facts in your quotations, provided they're correct, is a guaranteed way to attract the attention of an editor and means your message has more clout in the article or video itself. Tip seven. A little bit of healthy pushback can be helpful. Speaking to a journalist can be intimidating, 
but don't let that push you into thinking that you can't stand up for yourself just a little bit. Sometimes we ourselves don't quite get our article pitches or our ideas right, so you can contribute to that process robustly. Phrases like one thing that's relevant here is, or it's worth mentioning X, so can we talk about that, are very useful ways of directing the conversation. Like I say, don't try and control that process, but robust contributions are rarely unappreciated. Tip eight, and this is obvious, don't libel anyone. Uh, slanderous accusations get you in a lot of trouble. Um, so be careful what you say. The best defense against libel is the truth. So if you can't provide at least a little bit of evidence that something you're saying is true, don't say it on the record. And it may be best just not to say it at all. And tip nine, be personable. Personal rapport is absolutely the lifeblood of journalistic relationships. And perhaps sometimes this gets forgotten because a lot of what gets talked about, particularly in the financial media, is very, very technical. But actually, eye contact where appropriate, uh, mutual respect and a little bit of back scratching are what all of this is all about. Um, and a little bit of passion and enthusiasm are golden ingredients too. So smile, even when you're talking on the phone and perhaps someone can't see you. We know you're doing it and it really adds a little bit of magic to the process. And then finally, tip 10, and this is the hardest tip of the lot, and it's the one that I agonized over because it's a big demand. Be original. This is particularly important when you're doing things like profile interviews or longer chats with journalists that want to find out the breadth and depth of what makes you tick as a person and perhaps what's going on in your business. And what do I mean by being original? I mean, know your market. Loads of people, for instance, do cash flow modeling nowadays. So while it might be a revelation to an inexperienced client of yours, it's not so much breaking news to us. That means you have to decide what makes your business really special, work out what the firm's story is, and tell it with gusto, humor, and aplomb. Your uniqueness will shine through, and you'll get more calls from, pe calls from people like me. Likewise, if you're responding on the hoof to a breaking story, a pithy and original turn of phrase will put your firm at the top of the article and probably in the headline. So for example, there are imaginative ways of saying that something is disappointing. Jazz it up a bit and hammer your message home. So that concludes my 10 tips. If you've got questions about any of this or about the process of speaking to a journalist and you'd like to ask me something, do, do feel free to get uh, on the email uh, at osmith at cityy.co.uk. Uh, and if you want an off, off the record chat, that is absolutely fine. We don't bite. Have a great Friday and a great weekend when it comes. Thanks very much. Well, 10 fantastic tips there. And I think you managed to jam those into about five minutes. So nice one, well done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ollie. No problem. Thank you. So now it's time for our big breakfast topic. And today we're talking about the return to the office. So joining us to kick off on this segment, we have Hannah Wimes from Next Wealth and Sonia Raj from Money Marketing. Hiya guys. Morning. Hiya. So Hannah, let's start with you. When was the last time you were in the office and how have you adapted to working from home? Um, so I think the last time I was in the office was actually over a year ago now. So we started working from home about two weeks before the national lockdown was announced. And um, so it feels like a very long time now and kind of hoping it's coming to an end at some point. And yeah. um, when I first started working from home, I definitely thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was. Um, I thought that, you know, I'd, I'd worked from home before, most Fridays and kind of just the odd time that I didn't really need to be in the office. Um, but actually, I found that it was really difficult and it was permanent and I needed to kind of get myself sorted and adapted to kind of the new environment. So in the first month, there was really kind of two key things that I had to take a step back and really think about um, to make sure that I was kind of creating a bit of a positive working environment. So the first thing that was really key to me was to set up my own workspace. So I got a desk, I got a chair, I put it somewhere in the house that had a nice background and a bookshelf um, just to make sure that it was fitting. Um, and somewhere that I could say that, you know, that's my office, that's where I work, it's where I focus and I can concentrate. And um, the kitchen table was really distracting for me. So this was really essential to kind of create this area that was separate to um, my home and kind of my personal life. Um, I also then along kind of that journey of kind of understanding the whole mindset that I could create, um, I started to think about my routine in the day. And I found that now I had this new setup, I wasn't leaving it. Um, I was sitting at this chair for about eight plus hours a day. I was having lunch at my screen and I was just getting really fatigued by just being in front of computer all day so I started to kind of bring in different 
things to do that would just get me away really so like being really disciplined to go and have my lunch elsewhere have a bit of change of scenery maybe if I was getting really tired or walk around the block and kind of refresh myself and I think it's things that we've kind of taken for granted when we're in the office that you can turn to a colleague next to you and like chat to them and look away from your screen or go for a coffee or go for lunch and just get outside for a bit so for me I definitely went in really naive to the whole thing and um, but after making those little changes I kind of made it into a bit more of a, a positive working space um, and it's been quite well since then. I think, like you say, it's so important to have that space that you associate with working and again, taking time to actually get away from that space and just take a bit of a break, maybe go for a walk, eat not at your desk. Um, now, how do you feel about returning to the hustle and bustle of London? Um, so I'm kind of in two minds about this. Um, I'm definitely not looking forward to being on a tube or being packed in and it being really warm and busy at eight o'clock in the morning. It's just definitely not something I'm eager to get back to. Um, but I really do miss kind of the buzz of London as well. So, you know, once you've come up into the street, it's really busy and um, there's kind of an energy which I didn't realise how much I kind of feed off that in a sense. And it's definitely something that I'm not achieving going from the kitchen to my desk in the morning. So just being around people again and kind of playing off that energy and being in the city. And obviously if I'm in London, I'm going to be in an office with my team, which I'm really looking forward to because I think it's really hard to be that kind of like creative and bounce ideas off each other when we're we're over Zoom or you know meetings are kind of cut to the hour because you've got something else in. So I'm I will sacrifice having to go onto the tube if it means we can be back in that kind of hustle and bustle and energy and be in the office to see my team. Yeah, definitely seeing the team again is going to be lovely, I, I bet. And Sonia, how are you feeling about returning? And uh, specifically, obviously, it's going to be the rush hour, the tube and the lunches at Pratt. How are you feeling about that? <laughs> um, so I think the last time I was in the office was was obviously a year and a, a bit ago, but it was after I'd just come back from a holiday in Jamaica. So it was one day in and we were just told, OK, now you're working from home. So at the time, I think I went into it quite naive, like, oh, I've just had a holiday and now I'll be working from home and it would be quite nice to have the jet lag kind of balance out. Um, but I think quite quickly it, it, I realised that it is quite hard to be at home all the time and, and the same environment. Um, so you do need to, to ensure you've got a change of scenery. Um, in terms of, I guess, how I'm, I'm feeling, I think I'm quite looking forward to, to being able to just pick up a coffee. It's something as simple as that. I mean, I, I can do that now, obviously, but you don't because I'm not just picking it up on my commute and, and going about my day. Um, so that's kind of one of the main things that I've missed. And then obviously being around your team. So as a journalist, you it's a lot easier to have a conversation with someone when you're just sitting next to them and, you know, bounce ideas off each other with your colleagues. Um, so not being able to do that or meaning that I've got to, you know, call them on Teams in order to, to just have that chat, which is more screen time. Um, I think it'll be quite nice to have that. But but I'm definitely not missing the whole, or I'm not looking forward to the whole commute, um, you know, the early mornings and, and the kind of um, rush hour that you've got to go on the tube with all these people and have everyone breathing the same air as you. I'm not looking forward to that, um, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be a shock to everyone's system a little bit going from being at home all the time to going back to London, being in the office. Do you think there's anything businesses can do to help people transition with that back to work from being at home all the time? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, definitely. I think those businesses that kind of don't almost offer that are, are going to be left behind at this stage. Um, you know, in a pre-COVID world, there were a lot of businesses that were saying, oh, you know, we don't really offer work from home or we don't believe in it. Or, and, and they kind of didn't, you know, engage with that because they thought it didn't work. But I think after a year of doing this as a country, everyone knows it is possible. You can work from home. You can be just as productive. And, you know, it, it, we've managed to do it for so long that I think businesses are going to have to be a bit more, um, you know, compromise a bit more with, with how employees feel about coming back so I think a good way to do that would be by offering you know two days in, at working from home and three days in the office or work out what that balance is for an employee so that you know that we're almost making the decision rather than it being a top-down this is what you're going to do um, kind of approach so I think that will be one way for sure that they can help. 
have to agree there yeah giving the employees the opportunity to sort of phase back into the office is definitely going to make a big difference i think and i'd I'd like to bring Vaveen back in here because i know the cii were were very early with allowing people to work from home how do you feel about the sort of normal working coming back and do you think there's anything that can help people readjust um i i'm calling it the new normal um i i think that this time last year interestingly um when I think about it, uh, our, our, our management did a fantastic job in, in ensuring that we transitioned from being in the office to being safe and, and working from home. And I'd like to believe and trust that our member employers, our members had a seamless experience of not recognising that we actually had all up sticks from the office and we're working from home and we're delivering you know, a, a, an equal service or standard of quality of service so, you know, that's the first thing. Um, I'd, I'd suggest that for me personally, um, I like the balance of the new normal that we're going to be looking at. Um, I like seeing my colleagues. I like interacting with them. I like the whole team element of where I work. But equally, I need time, focus time to focus on projects and tasks. So, you know, that's something to think about. Um, I know I'm camouflaging really well, but I've done 30 years worth of commuting. So I'm, I'm not going to miss that that grind of commute, but it's going to give us more time. And, and I think flexibility is the key word. And I've spoken to a lot of um, employers and they've talked about how there's a question, is it possible to have flexible hours and flexibly work? And clearly, you know, shouldn't have taken the pandemic, but it took a pandemic to demonstrate that that's the case. And it's not just around flexible, I need to pick up family, kids, care, whatever it may be. It's having the brain space to do an hour of devoted mindfulness and well-being, whether that's exercise or reading a book or and managing that around your work time and, and delivering quality work and a good standard of work. So I think that's what I've taken away from uh, this whole uh, pandemic, working from home, um, restructuring the way we order our lives, rethinking about what's important. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing my colleagues face to face. And as I mentioned, you know, in during when we were speaking earlier, a large part of what we do in financial planning and insurance is relationship based. We, we interact and speak with people. It's really important. And whilst we can do that on an online platform, there's something very special and unique about having that face-to-face human contact relationship, and particularly when you're building relationships based on trust, which is what our profession fundamentally, rudimentally works on, you know, trust of our clients, trust of each other. So I think that's my takeaway from going forward in the future, you know, a new normal. Amazing. Thank you. And I completely agree. I'm so excited to actually sit in front of a, a real person. It feels like I've sort of forgotten what it feels like, to be honest. Um, perfect. So to wrap up the show, and this is a question to sort of all of you now, what is the thing you're looking forward to most when lockdown ends? Who's going to take it away first? Fabine? <laughs> I am looking forward to seeing my family um i haven't seen my father in over a year he's abroad um so i'd like to physically see him touch him and just not have a a telephone conversation i am looking forward to hugging my family and friends and i'm looking forward to seeing my work colleagues and my acquaintances and my wider circle without being two meters apart and wearing a mask frankly (laughs) absolutely completely agree (laughs) hannah what about you um, I think for me, I'm just really looking forward to actually being able to, you know, make a plan and like look forward to it and not rely on the government telling me that I can't do it in like a couple of days time. So definitely making a plan, maybe going on holiday and just looking forward to doing stuff with like family and friends. Absolutely. Sonia? Um, I think for me, it's probably going on holiday. Um, I think I'm just, I just really want to go on holiday. So I'm waiting for the day that I'm allowed to to take some time off, not to just sit in front of the television, like to, to actually be able to get out the house, go for a meal, go on holiday, get a flight, that kind of thing. Um, it's probably, it's probably the one thing I'm looking forward to most. Can't agree more with everyone who cannot wait for a holiday. <laughs> So that's it for today's show and for the first season of the Next Gen Planners Big Breakfast. So we'll be back later in the year with the new season. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and bye for now. See you later.